come today to Symbols 9. And what, what are we doing? Why are we here? What is it that we have come for? We're here together. I'm here with you for the same reason. It's like Italian style family food. It's a big bowl that's set in the middle and all of us help ourselves. I'm helping myself, you help yourselves. The words, the language that comes out of this particular chair, to sort of paraphrase Krishnamurti for a second, is just simply a vehicle for community focus. My words are given to this food bowl in the center, but your hearing is your own. You hear what you want to hear, what you need to hear. You think about what you need to think about. Don't worry about the structure of whether I'm making sense. Just let your own hearing take what you can, hear what you need to hear, and make out of it what you need to make. The fact that this is a highly structured presentation is not necessary to your participation here today. If there were a group of musicians playing a little ensemble of Mozart, you would just listen to the music. You don't need to pay attention to the musical structure to appreciate it. And so the same here. If you get curious, if you get to the place where you'd like to know more, you can always go back via the tapes and re-inspect, re-live, re-participate in this particular lecture today. So what's being done here is like live action communal sharing, me sharing with you, not my voice to you, but my voice, and I'm listening to my voice as it comes out spontaneously. There are things on the table, but I'm not speaking in terms of them, speaking spontaneously. Now this takes a facility, for sure, and after 30 years of doing this, it's something I can do. You too could do it, where you two have spent all that time on it, so it's no big thing. This, this language that comes out at this particular juncture is a language about symbols because we take themes and those themes take about three months to go through. They take 12 weeks to go through. They take 12 weeks if one was looking at a structure in three different phases, four weeks for a beginning, an introduction, and four weeks for a concluding, an end. And the middle four weeks would just be a middle four weeks. So that the 12 lectures on a given theme have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they divide themselves into thirds. And each third has a four-part section. Now the reason for this is because historically our development, our being here in the minds and bodies in the civilization that we actually inhabit are all structured by relationalities of these primordial numbers and relations. The original formulation in terms of the Western psyche of this kind of structure goes back about 2,500 years ago to Pythagoras. And if you were to look at a Pythagorean educational presentation of 2,500 years ago, the very first thing that they would show, whether it's in the dust written by a finger, or whether it's on some kind of a surface written by a stylus, by some kind of a pen, the presentation would be a dot, and below that, two dots, 
and below that three dots, and below that four dots. And that that one, two, three, four would be framed in a triangle. Now the Greek word for that particular symbol was tetrakis. Tetra meaning four, tractus meaning a, um, a presentational focus, four dots, four levels of dots. The first level of dot is what we would call one, or you could also call that unity. The second level are the two, but they could also be called a binary or a duality, or as Pythagoras would call them, were he to speak English, he would say that would be a pair. The three are like a triad, a trinity, a trilogy. The four is like a square or a quaternary. And if you put these four levels together, the one, the two, the three, the four, they add up to 10. Or in the words of uh, film phraseology, a perfect 10. And by putting a triangle around it, it means that there is a stable shape. The triangle is the first stable shape in geometric perception. So that that shape of that symbol of that Pythagorean tetrachus was the way in which the entirety of the human capacity was symbolized. But in order to express that capacity, in order to put that symbolic diagram into action, they stretched a string, a wire string. And for the one, they left the string whole. For the two, they placed a fret in the middle of the string. For the three, they placed two frets exactly one-third from the ends. And for the four, they placed three frets, one in the middle and two in the middle of each of those hands. So that when you sounded the string by itself, it gave a certain tone, a certain pure tone. When you sounded the two, where the string was cut in half, the relationship of that half string sound to the original sound had a recognizable quality. And the same for the thirds and the same for the fourths. So that Pythagorean music was a revolutionary way to express this geometrical symbol of human wholeness. And it was found that once you had those relationships, not only one, two, three, four, and whatever they turn out to be, but the relationality of one to two, of two to three, of three to four, of one to three, of two to four, of one to four. Once you had all those relationalities in a set and you included the elements of one, two, three, four, once that set of elements and relationalities was posited together, they constituted what we would today call in higher mathematics in the late 20th century, we would call that a density matrix. That is to say, it is a set or a box of goodies. It's a, an order of relationalities and elements that form an alphabet out of which one can make a language about what's real. You can talk about what's real and in particular, specifically, what's real for us using a vocabulary made out of the letters of those elements and those relationalities.
Now, the fact that this could happen was very mysterious. It's mysterious today. It was mysterious to them. This entire development came from Pythagoras because he blended three different civilizations together. He braided three totally different civilizations together. The first civilization that he had to work with was his own native Greek. Now, he wasn't born on the mainland of Greece. He was born on, on the island of Samos, which is today off the coast of Turkey. And those particular Greek colonies were Ionian Greek colonies. And they were largely merchants. They were like merchant marines. They were sailors who went around the Mediterranean trading. And so they were acquainted with many different kinds of people. But they also were the beginnings of equality of inquiry. And because all of the people who thought in terms of this process, this method of inquiry, were very similar. And because they all lived before Socrates, they're always called pre-Socratic philosophers, which is kind of like an odd term because there were no philosophers before Socrates. Philosopher means lover of wisdom. It means someone ardently, passionately devoted to wisdom. Not someone who just wants to know, but someone who needs to know. Someone who desires understanding, who loves wisdom. And I mean, you have to see this in a passionate, ardent, erotic way. Someone who's erotic for wisdom is a philosopher. The pre-Socratic philosophers were not ardent. They were not erotic. And so their thought method was always one of abstraction. And there's a whole bunch of them. There are a number of them. But they're all characterized by a tone, by a quality of abstractness. The popular way in the 1950s, if you were in a university to characterize the pre-Socratics, one thought that the entire world was fundamentally made of water. One thought fundamentally was made of fire. One thought fundamentally it's made of ether. And when they came to include Pythagoras with the pre-Socratics, they said of him, well, he thought that the fundamental thing the world was made of was number. Which is the kind of reductive 50s American university way of misunderstanding. But it serves for our purposes. Pythagoras actually is the first to understand that the Greek method of abstraction was insufficient to characterize reality. That the pre-Socratic abstract method left out some of the juice that was essential to reality. So he left Greece. And he traveled to Egypt because the Greeks had been learning from Egypt for over 1,500 years by that time. We know today that classical Greek, as written in the time of Pythagoras and Plato, was written in a different style some thousand years before them. And that style is called Linear B. And Linear B was a very... Um, curious uh, decipherment problem. In the middle of the 20th century, tablets in Linear B were not recognized at all in terms of what they were saying because they, they thought it was a very odd language that might have had something to do with ancient Phoenicians or something like that. And it was an architect, a British architect named Michael Ventris who deciphered Linear B. And it was fantastic discovery that linear B actually is an archaic form of Greek. That if you pronounce the linear B words in classical Greek, you get very close to the meaning. You just have to tailor the pronunciation somewhat. It shifts, much like if you try to read Chaucer in modern English, you mispronounce it. 
because Middle English of Chaucer's day has a different vowel emphasis, a different consonant um, way of expressing. So it turns out that linear B, that old quality of Greek language, shows that the Greeks were learning from the Egyptians even back in the 17, 1800s BC. And so Pythagoras had very good reason to go to Egypt. It was a time-honored pilgrimage. Incidentally, Linear B is not the first way or wave by which the Greeks learned from the Egyptians. Earlier than Linear B, there's also a form of archaic Greek called Linear A. And Linear A wasn't translated until just about a generation ago. Linear A goes back to the quality of Greek, which was synonymous of the time of Sargon of Akkad, back about 2300 BC, back almost uh, another six, 700 years from Linear B. And it shows that at that time, those archaic Greeks were also learning from Egypt. But in the archaic Greek, in the Linear A, they not only learned from Egypt, but they learned from the ancient civilization of the Euphrates and Tigris river valleys. That linear A has great affinities in its wisdom that the Greeks of the distant archaic period understood the world in terms in which the Egyptians and the Sumerian Akkadians would have understood. If one goes back even farther than Linear A, there was no recognizable Greek language, but the language that was there before then is called ostensibly Indo-European. It's a language that was spoken some 5,000 years ago or more. And if one goes back to that kind of Indo-European language, one finds that the way in which wisdom matured in men and women in terms of language was shared across a broad swath of the world. Everything from central China to the far reaches of India all the way to Ireland, that this entire swath of the Eurasian landmass including the Sahara Desert of Africa, northern Africa, all the way down to the jungle area, was all one psyche, was one language family. So that the disparate family groups that broke up from this, that broke up because of periods where the international contact would fade and there would be periods, long centuries of isolation, in which the men and women of the isolated areas began to modify the languages in different ways, and evolution took over. And that this alternation between periods of internationalism and periods of isolationism happened over many thousand years, several times. So that by Pythagoras' time, already, he was living 2,500 years before us, but he was trying to understand what was the original wisdom before classical Greek was developed, before the Middle English Greek of Linear B was developed, before the Old English of Linear A was developed. What was the original language of wisdom, and how does one understand that? Now, fortunately for him in his time, there was a place in Egypt that still kept the record of that original language. It was a temple city. There were no, it wasn't a bedroom community. There were no suburbs. Was just one huge city devoted to a temple that was called Heropolis. sometimes called Heliopolis, City of the Sun, but it actually was 
the city of the higher order, higher wisdom. And so Pythagoras went there. And he went there from his native Samos, from his native Ionian Greek colonies as a very accomplished teacher, but he went there as a student. And there was so much for him to understand and learn that he spent 22 years there. And he learned the Heliopolan recension of the wisdom tradition. Now the Heliopolan recension of the wisdom tradition, we understand today because it's been reconstructed for us through a century and a half of archeological patient putting together. The really great savants in this were the French and one Englishman named uh, Wallace Budge, E.A. Wallace Budge. Let me talk for a second about Wallace Budge so that you can get a clearer picture of this. When the archeological discoveries of a century and a half ago were first being brought to light, the first wave of that were French. And the first genius in that was actually Napoleon, who when he went to Egypt was imitating Alexander the Great and carrying with him a whole brain trust full of people. And so the early discoverers of the archeological works in Egypt. The early um, wise scholars who were trying to put together this ancient original history were French. But we all know the voraciousness of the way in which the British Empire loved to take over beautiful things. And so most of the work ended up into the hands of the British Museum a great deal of the work. But it ended up there in crates. It ended up there en masse, in huge boatloads full of material. The first keeper of the British Museum was a man who was, uh, his name was Samuel Birch, and he was interested in pottery. In fact, he wrote one of the world's great treatises in two volumes on the history of pottery. But he was fascinated by a young teenager who kept hanging around the nascent British Museum. Wallace Budge, as of like a 13-year-old, was discovered to be an intellectual prodigy, somebody with an IQ of like 200. And so they found a suitable patron, a British lord, who put up the money to educate Wallace Budge. And what did they educate him in? They educated him in learning ancient languages. And so he patiently learned every single ancient language. He learned to speak, to read, and even to write every ancient language and finally was in a position in his later life to be able to understand how all of these languages did have a focus in a very distant antiquity, he learned to think in that way. By the way, it's Wallace Budge's two-volume dictionary of Egyptian hieroglyphics that's still in print from Dover paperbacks. Budge put together, like one of these incredible British Empire geniuses, put together the focus of how the Heliopolitan recension came down and was focused about 1800 BC, about the time when linear A was shifting to linear B. That crucial interface in history where the archaic was coming into the ancient. And he found that the focus of wisdom at that time was a book, uh, the book in Egy Egyptian, um, its uh, translation would be the book of coming forth by day, and we all know it as the Egyptian book of the dead. So that the Egyptian book of the dead would have been the ancient intermediate text, the prism through which Pythagoras saw the Heliopolitan recension. But what was before, what was beyond, what would one have seen through that prism? of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. 
what was the original writing form? It was not books, but it was sarcophaguses. And so the texts before the Egyptian Book of the Dead are called, colloquially today, coffin texts. That instead of being written on a book, the only way to have this book was to be in the presence of the sarcophagus, of the coffin. And it was written wrapped around the sarcophagus. And it became apparent that even before these coffin texts, that those texts appeared not on the sarcophagus, but on the inside of the pyramid, on the inside of the tomb. And when one goes back to the most ancient of all, the pyramid text, the pyramid of Unas. Unas lived in uh, fifth dynasty Egypt, and he was a contemporary of Sargon of Anka, about 2300s BC. The inside of the pyramid was a book which could only be read by walking through the structure so that it was an architectural book that only the physical journey of walking through the pyramid would allow you to read the text and the culmination of the text was reached in the room where the sarcophagus was. But the genius of men and women, evolutionarily at work, found a way to truncate, to condense, to shorten the pyramid text so that it would fit on a sarcophagus. So the coffin texts are a condensation of the pyramid text. But the Egyptian Book of the Dead is a collation of all of the coffin texts, of all of the pyramid texts, brought together to a common symbolic focus. So that if one mastered the Egyptian Book of the Dead, it would be easy to go back to any pyramid, to any coffin text, and to read it, because this was the symbolic focus. Now, the Heliopolin recension that Pythagoras studied was that of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And one finds in there, for instance, there are sections of the Egyptian Book of the Dead that reappear some 2,000 years later almost phrase for phrase, but they do not appear before 2,000 years because they were kept secret. They were only passed on in an oral way. They were never passed on in a written way. And they were written down 2,000 years later at the beginning of the second century AD because there were so few men and women left alive, they realized that they were going to die out, that physically there was going to be no one to pass it on to, so they wrote them down. And those sections of the Egyptian Book of the Dead, of that Heliopolis recension that survived, became the hermetic treatises of classical antiquity, which we have about 13, 14 of them today. So that one could draw a direct line of about 3,000 years of writing from the pyramid text through the coffin texts, through the Egyptian Book of the Dead, through the Pythagorean mystery tradition to the Hermetic treatises. And that 3,000 years of development, symbols were the synthesizing language by which all of this was conveyed. And the conveyance was in a symbolic form known as amulets. Amulets protect meaning. They seal meaning. They seal it so that it's safe, so that it gets to you without any contamination and hole. But symbols also have a transformational kicker in them. They shift from being amulets to being talismans. And when symbols shift to being talismans, they open up meaning. They deliver it back out again. So that the Egyptian Book of the Dead is the first time that what we would call a book 
became the synthesizing amulet and talisman at the same time of an entire civilization. Not just the Egyptian civilization, but the original civilization of this whole swath from central China to Ireland. So that in the time of Wallace Budge, about the early 1900s, a young Irishman named Evans Wentz, who wrote a book called The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, got fascinated when it was pointed out to him that the only place on earth that has similar kinds of psychic structures and symbolic structures to ancient Ireland was Tibet. And so Evans once went to Tibet to find out how can this be? Are the Tibetans Irishmen? Did they get so snookered that they wandered out of Irish bars all the way to Tibet? I mean, in those days, it was a possibility. Before the IRA, Ireland was really wild. One of our figures today is W.B. Yeats, is one of the wildest people ever. <laughs> Yeats was a modern day Pythagorean. Yeats is not only one of the world's greatest poets, he was the head of the Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a hermetic reconstruction of the ancient wisdom that Pythagoras learned, of the ancient wisdom that Pythagoras learned about thousands of years before. And we'll get to Yeats in just a moment. But it's like Evans once found when he went to Tibet. He took his Irish, Celtic, mythological, fairy tale, poetic insight quality to Tibet. And when he listened to the Tibetan Rinpoche's, especially the one uh, Samdup who gave him the recension of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it's Wences' translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead into English that generally we would read today. He heard in the Tibetan Book of the Dead exactly what would be heard in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And it struck him again that not only are there parallels between Tibet and Ireland, but there are parallels between Tibet and Egypt. Meaning not only is there an interplay between the Indus civilization and the Nile civilization, and who knows what's going on in Europe, but also in Central Asia, including Tibet. And so this entire psyche emerges in our time as indicating that there once was a planetary wisdom, not as a metaphysical, fingers crossed, eyes crossed, hopefulness, but an actuality. But that because of the vicissitudes of the way in which isolation periods alternated with international periods, that the various sections of it evolved in different paces, in different languages, in different emphases. And only when you master any particular area do you get the insight into how the other areas say the same thing only with a southern accent or with a northern accent. In our time, verging on the 21st century, we're entering into a period which is almost unheard of. We're coming out of one of the great international periods, but instead of going back into an isolation period, we're going into a transcendental international period. Instead of there being an international kind of humanity, there's going to be a humanity which is spread throughout the entire star system so that the planet itself will be but one kind of nationality compared to the whole range of men and women who will be here in another couple of generations. Their home will be the entire star system. It will be a stellar civilization. 
But it will be in keeping. It will be still in that lineage that's there in that ancient wisdom. Because that ancient wisdom already understands and recognizes that the human personality, when it's mature, resonates to the universe. That the symbol by which we could talk about our deepest inner self when it's really radiant, when it's really together, when we really shine, we become like stars inside. And our stars have a way of symbolically radiating out in a musically consonant way and belonging in the stars of the celestial sphere. So that the whole ancient wisdom was that achieved men and women, when they die, their inner stars rise back up and join the heavens. That it's not a mythological, fanciful children's story, but it's a way of symbolically expressing what actually occurs, what, what actually happens. But the occurrence, the happening, is in terms of a musical consonance. And that musical consonance is an expression of a kind of a resonant element, resonant relationality, which can only be played if one knows how to read the music and the music arranges itself in notes, and the notes arrange themselves in sets, and those sets have a certain quality in the Egyptian, Greco-Egyptian hermetic tradition, the set is always in terms of an octave. In the Chinese rendition, they're always in terms of a five note scale. The consonance between the Chinese five and the Greco-Egyptian eight is actually very easy to have. In India, because of the proliferation of detail loving, in India, men and women who wanted to know, wanted to know to the nth degree. They would find out that some things were mysterious and they would just say, which th some things? How are they mysterious? And on and on. And after millennia, India developed a 16-part octave, only eight parts of which can be cognized, and eight parts cannot be cognized at all, ever, because they occur in an invisible trill. So when one looks at the Buddhist Abhidhamma, one sees that an um, atom of thought is a 16-part pattern eight parts of which are discrete and eight parts of which do not occur in any visible discursive way whatsoever. Yet they are an eight, but they're an eight in a completely non-objective complement to the eight that are. So India literally has the Western octave plus its invisible counterpart. Whereas in the Greco-Egyptian mystery tradition, one cannot even characterize the unknown eight. The unknown eight was characterized in ancient Egypt as Atum, the god who goes beyond gods, the godhead who is the fount out of which the gods come, but which in itself cannot be characterized. The Jewish version of it is that any graven image is certainly not God. So that there is a consonance between the Indian and the Egyptian, just a different in, in, emphasis. When one looks to the Chinese five, you can't immediately make the Chinese five phase energy cycle of the Taoist come into consonance with the octave of the Hermetic Egyptian tradition. The cue is that in the Western Hermetic tradition, the transformational node is always a five. That when one comes from the octave that can be specified 
to the octave that cannot be specified, that transformational node in and of itself is a five-phase transformational energy cycle characterized by the fifth phase, which is called the quintessence. Because what is shared between Egypt and China is alchemy. The two places in all the world that developed alchemy into a science are China and Egypt. And Chinese alchemy is so consonant with Egyptian alchemy that when someone like Joseph Needham went to write Science and Civilization in China, published by Cambridge University Press in about uh, 16 or 18 huge published tomes, he supposed that there must have been influence going both ways between ancient China and ancient Egypt, especially around the 400s uh, BC <coughs> in that era. And that one finds, in fact, in Chinese alchemy, qualities that only appeared in Egypt. And one finds in Egyptian alchemy, shortly after that, elements that only appeared in China. So there must have been contacts between them. But not just contacts, but there are ways in which the psyche of the alchemical Egyptians and the alchemical Chinese fit fit together in a consonance, because alchemical transformation in both civilizations is exactly the same. The Taoist and the Hermetic traditions meet there in a common focus. It's not just that the spheres are tangential at that point, but that they exchange at that point. The Chinese sphere emphasizes Tao whereas the Western hermetic sphere emphasizes um, eternity. The one emphasizes a zero base, which is the mystery beneath nature. The other emphasizes a mystery purpose, which is the infinity expression beyond nature. And the infinity of the Egyptians exchanges with the zero of the Taoist, both logically and mathematically and culturally without a hitch between them. I must say from my own experience, one can think bilingually in Taoist and Hermetic ways. It's just as if someone who is perfectly bilingual doesn't have to stop to translate. They could finish the sentence in the other language. It's like that. They're that consonant. What's interesting to us this morning here, why we're here, why we're getting into this, is that Pythagoras did not make any books, but there were three books that were authorized by Pythagoras that members of his mystical community were able to write them down, but they put them out in a limited edition, and they were very expensive, and they only made a few sets. And one of those sets was purchased by Plato. And it's Plato who, in his dialogues, expresses what the Pythagorean mystical communities did not express. But Plato's dialogues only go up to the threshold after which one has to live it. Plato's dialogues take you step by step up to the top step, but they do not take you into the temple the temple of knowledge, the temple of wisdom. So Plato's dialogues are a phase form step going up to the threshold of a structure which can only be entered into in a very special way. This structure, which was understood by Plato, was equally understood by W.B. Yeats in our own time, in the 20th century. And what Yeats understood was that that temple happens to be a realm of consciousness whose threshold is the mind, and that the steps come through a phase form transition, through phases of nature, through phases of ritual, through phases of myth, through phases of symbol 
And there they stop because to go one step beyond symbols takes a transformation which is not a step. The transformation is a threshold beyond the range of the steps. So you have to do something different. To put it in a prosaic way, and we'll take a break, the prosaic way is that you take four steps and then you jump. <laughs> because there's no way to step over the threshold. If you stepped over the threshold, you would be back at step three. And if you kept going, you would be back at step two and so forth. If you keep stepping, you devolve. So that the wisdom is that at a moment of transformation, you stop doing what you learned and you allow for some completely new activity to cue in. Instead of stepping, you jump. The colloquial way of expressing this ancient wisdom is that in order to enter to the divine, one has to have a leap of faith. You've heard the phrase, I'm sure. It's not just an old wives' tale phrase. It's an actual structural choreography. If you cannot leap to freedom, you're going to keep goose-stepping back into a tyranny. Let's take a break. These are some shots of Plato and Yeats. In keeping with our method, we always pair up books. And the technique is a new technique because books are no longer sufficient symbols for us to learn from. That is to say, we can learn an awful lot from books, but a great deal of what we have to learn transcends the form of the book. And so by pairing books together is a way of overcoming the limitations of the book and yet still using it as a tool. So it allows us to bridge, to span two different eras. The era of the book belongs to an era which is just ending. It's an era where men and women lived by symbolic civilization. That is to say, we were no longer Paleolithic. We no longer hunted animals or hunted the plants, nor were we Neolithic. We no longer were just taming animals and taming plants, but we had moved to a third level of civilization, which was symbolic civilization. That third level of civilization, which Pythagoras belonged to in Plato, and Yates, and many of the other figures. And we live at the cusp, at the end, of symbolic civilization. Only what is emerging, what is coming out, is not yet sufficiently there so that we could characterize it with any kind of certainty. All that we know is that it is a much broader scope. And the scope can only be indicated by the fact that Previously, we have lived and been born and died on a single planet, and that the new civilization will be at least as broad as a whole star system, so that everything in our star system will be home turf, not only to us in our later years, but to our children and our grandchildren. And it's not necessary for us to travel all the way to Pluto to inhabit this star system. Our psyche has already made that journey. Voyager 2, which was launched in the 1970s, already pioneered for us the psychic extension of our capacities out beyond Neptune, out beyond Pluto. And there's a famous photograph taken by Voyager 2, one of the last photographs that JPL over here in Pasadena commanded the satellite to take. And it was a family photograph. 
Voyager 2 turned its camera back on the star system and had every planet in its alignment. And it took a family portrait of the star system. So that we've already psychically inhabited the whole star system. It may take about 200 years or about 10 generations of men and women to actually physically go and get dirty out there and, and do this. But it's already the realm which is real to us. So inhabiting a star system means that our civilization, the best name that I could come up with is of a stellar civilization, meaning the whole star system. A stellar civilization belongs to a much higher order than symbolic civilization. But we have a lot of difficulty understanding symbolic civilization. And so this education takes its whole first year to try to position us to be able to understand the natural cycle in terms of its broadest extent out to include the symbolic mind. Because in a very real way, our symbolic minds are still natural. They're still a part of the cycle which we recognize as nature. True, it's a very broad nature. It's a very deep nature. It's a very highly mysterious nature. But men and women in the wisdom traditions have always understood nature in this way. It's always been special. It's always been mysterious and deep. And it has been so um, since symbolic civilization first began to get its written record. And its written record first came about 5,000 um, years ago, about 3,000 BC. The first time that we find a written record, the pyramid texts in Egypt, for instance. And when we find the first writings, men and women already are very wise. They already have the whole cycle scoped and understood. They understand everything from nature, through ritual, through myth, through symbols, and see that from the base of a symbolic mind, one can look into a supernatural realm, which today we would call conscious vision. Conscious visioning. They called it by the name which Pythagoras called it after having studied in Egypt for 22 years. He went to Iran and studied in Iran for 11 more years. And he learned to call this conscious visionary realm a magic realm. And so the word magic, which comes from the Iranian magi, passes into the language even today. We use the term in English, magic. Magic is the supernatural. Magic is above nature. And this realm above nature means that the laws which work in nature have to be transformed because only transformed nature is able to work in a magical realm. In a peculiar way, the easiest thumb, rule of thumb by which to understand this is the difference between fairy tales and myths. Myths are a part of the natural integral cycle, whereas fairy tales are a part of a differential cycle which is completely visionary and transcends nature. <coughs> the work by Plato that we're using is his dialogue called Phaedrus, and I'd like to just read you a couple of sentences from this translation of the Phaedrus by uh, Plato. This occurs in the one volume collection of all of Plato's uh, dialogues. It's published by the Bollingen uh, Foundation. And uh, they used some money from the Mellon family to put these out. Uh, the Bollingen series and the Phaedrus translated here by a man named Hackforth. And it appears in a single volume with commentary from Cambridge University Press paperbacks. <clears throat> 
but here is just the translation in this one volume, Plato. This was written 2,400 years ago. It's the way in which symbolic civilization, very close to a time of its middle period, Plato comes about in the middle of symbolic civilization. This is how it was characterized. And now there awaits the soul the extreme of her toil and struggling. For the souls that are called immortal, so soon as they are at the summit, come forth. Notice the Egyptian, the coming of forth by day. They emerge, they come forth. Come forth and stand upon the back of the whole world. In other words, there's a sphere, which is the whole world. And at the summit of our soul's maturity, we stand on the entire world. We stand so that we become outside of the entire sphere of the world. For the souls that are called immortal, so soon as they are at the summit, come forth. That is, they are born out of the sphere of the world into a new realm and stand upon the back of the world, and straightway the revolving heaven carries them round, and they look upon the regions without. So that when you stand forth away from this world, you enter into a realm which is of the celestial worlds. And your movement now is no longer a movement which is natural to this world, your movement is supernatural and fits into the movement of the heavens so that you gain a cosmic rhythm to your life rather than a worldly rhythm. It's not that there's anything wrong with a worldly rhythm. And as long as you're in the natural cycle, you should have a natural rhythm, the rhythm of the seasons. But when you stand forth, at that point of transformational maturity, one has to be wise about this and recognize that you have emerged into a different order, into a different indexing of activity. And that while your natural activity was always integral, it always tended to fold into an integral wholeness the celestial realm, that transformational realm, works in a completely different kind of energy. Instead of integrating, it differentiates. It, instead of folding in, unfolds out. So that while one could say that the purpose and focus of the natural cycle of integration is to bring all things together to a singularity, which becomes so singular it becomes a zero. The differential realm tends to want to develop creatively more newer always, so that what it looks for is infinities, loves infinities, feels ardent about new things, different things. Not that the processes of integration are negated, not at all, but that increasingly the base upon which integration was founded slides into invisibility as the phases of consciousness come into play. So that the more that the supernatural comes into play, the more that the natural slides into an invisible subconscious, not out of existence, but out of the square of attention. Remember we talked about squares of attention in myth that are frame of reference. Even just the phrases that we use in everyday English convey 
the deeply ingrained intelligence that men and women have had about this, a frame of reference, four sides, that if you introduce a fifth side, it displaces that first side. And what was the second side now becomes the first. So that as the supernatural, as the magic capacity of mankind comes into play, its base shifts from nature to ritual. This is why in the frame of reference, where magic is happening, ritual is extremely important because it's the foundation. But look here. Magic is not the end all. Because what comes out of visionary consciousness, out of the magic of visionary consciousness, is another phase which we know as art. And as art comes into play, ritual goes out of play. To the extent that one becomes artistic, to that extent one becomes less and less ritualistic. So that the frame of reference which includes art has myth as its basis. doesn't relate to nature or ritual consciously, but relates to myth, to symbol, to vision, to art. And we'll see in our second year of this particular course, as we explore vision for three months, as we explore art for three months, we'll come to understand that there's a third phase that comes out. And the third phase is history. But following that principle, that square of attention, that frame of reference, as history comes into play, myth goes out of the frame of reference. History displaces myth. So that when you have a frame of reference that has history, art, vision, symbol is the basis. So that symbols become the basis of the frame of reference of history. That historical process founds itself on symbols, not on nature, not on ritual, and not on myth. So you can see that symbols are extremely important. Not only are the achievement of the natural frame of reference, the completion of that square of attention, but they are a part all the way through of the development of further realms of men and women, the realms of consciousness. <laughs> And one of the most difficult transitions of all is that transition where there's a fourth phase that comes, just like there are four phases to the natural integral cycle, there are four phases complementary to it, to the conscious cycle. And the fourth phase in consciousness is science. But look what happens. The more that science comes into play, the less that symbols participate in the frame of reference. So if one has not really understood symbols well, gotten acquainted with them really well, men and women will shy away from science as if it were a death threat. The Superman will indeed seem like a Frankenstein. Not just in one example, like in Mary Shelley's imagination, but in the very structure of the way that that transformation happens. Science will appear to be demonic by a population who are insufficiently educated as to the complementary reality of symbols. So a really healthy founding in understanding symbols is essential What's it essential to? It's essential to the fact of science. It's essential to the navigating of the perils of history. It's essential to the creation and appreciation of art. It's essential to the development of visionary consciousness. And in and of itself, it's the maturation of the mind. So the most crucial phase of all is symbols. It's crucial because if it does not get appreciated to the extent to where at least you're open about it, 
you understand that you don't know everything about it. That would be okay. That's called Socratic ignorance. Socrates is the first person to realize that he could not master symbols completely because they just weren't explored completely in his day. And so the only truthful reality that he could adopt for himself was that he knew that he didn't know completely. This is called Socratic ignorance. And his dedication was to disclose in every dialogue, in every conversation, with people who said that they did know, to disclose to them that what they do know is only a part of what one could know, and that that realm of what one could know, in fact, was open-ended because there were many areas that human beings just hadn't investigated at all. And in Socrates' day, one of the newest areas that had not been investigated were those areas that Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans opened up. The realms of musical relationalities, which set structure to the way in which act action had efficacion in nature. One of the ways in expressing this was that the lyre of Orpheus could tame wild animals. <laughs> but not only could it tame wild animals, but music could be a medicine for the soul of men and women. You could take a sick man or woman, a sick human being, and with the right musical therapy, you could heal them. That the psyche, the human psyche, was a part of this whole integral cycle, which was natural. And so that symbolic relationalities between musical notes and musical octaves and scales and compositions of melodies done with these notes in those scales would carry their order back into anything in the natural realm, whether they be animals or plants or the psyches of sick people. And that the healing was a bringing of them back into consonance with universal symbolic good order. This was completely unexplored in Socrates' day. Socrates' teacher, by the way, was a woman. Her name was Diotima. And Diotima was a Pythagorean. And she taught him the way in which Pythagoreans taught, not by books, but by living language. But the living language was a symbolic language. And the symbolic language that the Pythagoreans used had a particular effect. It couldn't be written on paper. Those words were so scintillating that they couldn't, without reduction, be put onto page. They couldn't be put onto a wall of a pyramid. They couldn't be put onto a sarcophagus, a coffin. They couldn't be put into a book or on a scroll. That the only medium, the only tablet, as it were, that could in receive that scintillating language was the human mind. So that Pythagorean living language inscribed itself upon the mind of man. So that the mind of man became a living book. Instead of the hier hieroglyphic language of mystery rebirth being put on the insides of the pyramids or on the sarcophagus or on the book, they were now made on the inside of the mind so that the person's mind became a living book. So the Pythagorean tradition was that one had to prepare oneself to be open enough to, record, to have enough mind to record these living words. And that when you did, your own mind then would be your, quote, text. But not only a text, it would be a transformational vehicle by which you would be able to 
transform and be carried into the larger realms of conscious vision, of conscious differentiation. But that the kicker in the works was that if you misunderstood this process in a mechanical, mechanistic way, instead of crossing the threshold, you would start on a devolving steps going back regressively. And that it was such a subtle difference at the beginning that you could not know at the beginning whether you were transforming or regressing. There's no way to tell whether you're transforming or regressing initially. So the classic way of saying it, I think it's one of the phrases uh, uh, ascribed to Jesus, by their fruits you shall know them. That if, it tr if you follow what turns out from this, what happens after this, where does this lead to? Then you can tell pretty certainly. You can tell when when you're killing your own family members because they don't believe in the right thing, you know you've gone the wrong way. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that graphic, but you get the picture. So in wisdom traditions, there was always a double reluctance to let somebody know what's going on. The first reluctance is that they misunderstood it as a death and wouldn't do it for that reason. And the second was the other side of the coin that they understood it as a way of gaining power quickly over themselves and others. And that's always a regressive step because the threshold is one of giving up rather than taking over. So that the classic way of phrasing it was the last st stage of integration is acceptance. You have to learn how to just accept, accept it. What is the definition of truth? Meaning accepted. So acceptance had a very mm, particular, I can almost say it had a peculiar place Acceptance had the place of zero in the cardinal order of things. Acceptance in and of itself purely is nothing. It's not a doing of anything. Acceptance is not an action. But one has to be very subtle here. It's also does not constitute a non-action, except metaphorically. The best that one can say, like Henri Bergson used to talk about uh, um, durée being creative time, it occurs, but what occurs one cannot say. Only that one can see that it definitely has an effect and the effect of crossing the threshold is that creative insight begins to happen everywhere. Whatever you do begins to have a, a flavor. It has a tone of aliveness. And as Yeats found, as Yeats pointed out many times in his work, the further that one goes with that resonant consonance of consciousness really having crossed a threshold, is that one begins to notice that your life history begins to have synchronistic parallels with world history. And as you become more and more complete as your person, you see that the cosmos becomes more and more complete as a divine realm. So that person and cosmos in tandem as a pair tend to mature together. Now to someone like Plato or someone like Yeats, it became utterly fascinating. And they refused to give it up. They refused to just uh, let it be. They wanted to investigate it. And yet they realized they couldn't use the old natural techniques of investigation. 
So they had to find new techniques of investigation. For Plato, he used the Socratic means of backing into realization, of having a dialogue where two or more people discuss and find out that progressively they don't know what they're talking about. That as they really get into some subject and see really what it entails, they realize that nobody here is an expert. And that the only conclusion to a platonic dialogue that's successful is that everybody in the room realizes that they don't know, but they know that they don't know. They all acquire, and they share as a community, Socratic ignorance. And Socrates, several places in Plato's dialogue, says, at this point, men and women, for the first time in reality, really become companions. They really are companions now, ready to investigate the unknown in quite a realistic way. Because they know they have a better chance to do it together than individually. Because they can talk to each other about it. Like outriggers on a canoe, keep each other a little more safer from ch tipping over from these perils. And also for keeping on track. And this is totally Pythagorean. The Pythagorean basis for community was the shared inquiry into the mysteries of reality and not politics or religion or ethnocentricity or whatever. It had nothing to do with those. Those things are all nice on tribal level, but when you're dealing with the perils of consciousness, those things are not going to help you at all. In fact, they're irrelevant. Consciousness can't tell if your passport says that you're Czech or you're black or that you're Jewish or what doesn't, consciousness doesn't read those. What it reads is, are you alive creatively here? And so Socrates and Plato Socrates as the teacher of Plato, Socrates as the protagonist of Plato's dialogues, is the first philosopher. But he is a philosopher in the sense of a Pythagorean. He's trying to seed men and women to become companions in this inquiry after wisdom, after conscious wisdom. Now some 2,400 years later, Yeats in his era, Yeats dies in um, 1939. So he's a contemporary. Born about 10 years before Jung, 1865. Yeats was an extraordinary young man. He was born in the western part of Ireland, and he had an uncle who sensed that Yeats was psychically very uh, capricious. And so the uncle used to practice. They used to go on walks together. And the uncle would walk up on top of a ridge of hills, and Yeats would walk underneath, and the uncle would think thoughts, and later would ask Yeats to um, tell him what thoughts he was thinking of, experiments in telepathy. And so Yeats, from a little boy, was brought up in such a way that a little later in life, he understood that William Blake was a natural mystic <laughs> because he also was that way. In fact, Blake helped write one of the first great books. Uh, Yeats helped uh, a man named Ellis write one of the first great books on Blake. In the Victorian era, not many people appreciated Blake, but Yeats did. He saw him as a very special person because he recognized he's one of our new tribe. When Yeats was a capricious teenager and he went to London and he fell in with this occult London society of people, he showed up one time at Madame Blavatsky's place. She was busy talking to someone, so she uh, motioned for him to just stay in the foyer. 
And she went on with her conversation in the big living room. And teenage Yates went over to this uh, Bavarian cuckoo clock, and he stood there in front of it, and it chimed. The little bird came out, sang to him, and went back in. So when her visitor left, she went over to him, and she showed him that the clock had no inner workings whatsoever. It had no gears. <laughs> so she invited him to all her soirees, and she would tell all her occult friends to learn from young Willie, the teenager, because like he was natural genius at psychic realm. He didn't have to read all these books. He didn't have to read them to know he could do. What does Yoda tell uh, Luke Skywalker? He says, don't try, do. Yates could do. But he got interested, how do I do? How does this happen? And so at the age of 24, Yates became a member of a nascent group in London called the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And after about 10 years, Yates was ostensibly the head of the order because he was... I gave a lecture once on Yeats and Jung, two magicians of the 20th century. He was like Jung. He could just simply do it. One time, Aleister Crowley came to one of the meetings of the Golden Dawn, and Yeats threw him out. He said later, he said, mystery schools are not reform schools. <laughs> We're not out to be glamorous outlaws to impress other people, we're leaving that whole sphere behind. <laughs> we're indeed going where no man has gone before, out there. And what counts is not outrageousness, but boundlessness. And what holds in boundlessness is, an, is, is a perfect consonance because that constants will go wherever boundlessness allows it. And so if you're in tune with the infinite, you're on your way. There's a beautiful book by a man named Ralph Waldo Trine called In Tune with the Infinite. Or another book that uh, was entitled Companions Along the Way, Ruth Montgomery. These kinds of phrases are indicative of people who do this. They don't know everything about this. They couldn't give these kinds of lectures, but they live lives in which they do this. And there are millions of such people. But there aren't many people yet who can speak this way, who can put it together and deliver it as an educational double cycle. But there'll come a time when it's just, it'll be like fresh water and pure air, it'll just be a part of what there is. No big thing. Right now it's unusual. One of the earmarks of the real is that to the ego, it's boring. The ego right away has a very favorite little litany. When it comes across something new, it right away says, A, it's not new, and B, it's not true. <laughs> and C, it's no big thing, and dismisses it. Because the ego is part of a regressive step down and is on the back side, I won't say the dark side of ritual, but it's on the back side. I don't say the behind side. I'm trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> If you find that in your life actions that you're applying symbols to rituals, you can be reassured that you've already regressed pretty far. It's one thing to have an amulet which protects that inner meaning by sealing it. It's another thing to use it as a bludgeon to try and get somebody to do what you want them to do. That's a whole different thing. 
Amulets are not clubs. And they're not spears. And they're especially not nuclear weapons. And the wise use of an amulet is to develop its complement, which is its talismanic possibilities in consciousness. Then you've got it. Then you've got something that not only works for you, but opens up possibilities that you would never have known before. You couldn't have known them before because they were unimaginable. Not that they didn't exist, but even worse, they were not even a part of what could be imagined for existence. But with boundless consciousness, consciousness can go wherever it will go. When Moses asks God, he says, who shall I say sent me? The phrase is, I will be who I will be. Not I am that I am. That's an existential reduction done by bureaucrats around the time of Jeremiah's father, whose name was Hilkiah, at 700 BC. The phrase translates, I will be who I will be. It's a constant conscious boundlessness. And that's who's the flame in the bush. Because what used to be the mythological image that was in the bush was a sacrificial goat. And you can look in the British Museum, you can find archeological trinkets from those archaic areas and eras and you find the goat in the bush, the sacrificial goat in the bush, which was the mythological image then of the vehicle of sacrifice on mythological level. But the fire in the bush is an alchemical symbol. It means don't look at what you're sacrificing, but look at the whole process of the fire of sacrifice. And when you do symbolically, you transform it. You stop sacrificing things on it, and you use the process to transform yourself. And when that language is written on the inside of the mind, and the mind has the fire of intuition, then you have an alchemy that's worth doing. Then consciousness radiates just as if it were a star. And the whole cosmos recognizes, what does Blake say in one of the illustrations of the book of Job? Then that's the time when the morning stars sang together. And the Pleiades are not some kind of alien mythological emblem, but are a musical consonance of consciousness, which is astronomically real. But that's 21st century talk. Let's come back to Plato. We've only got a few minutes today, and we'll come back next week. We've got some time. We're going to spend three more weeks with Plato and Yeats, and we'll open this up even more. But recognize that there's a context here. The context is a symbolic strategy. What is the strategy? To bring the first year to a kind of a conclusion which is not permanent. We want to bring the first year to the kind of conclusion that pirouettes and starts a new cycle. So instead of a circle, you get an infinity sign. If you close the circle, it's a regressive step. Whereas if there's a transformational node and this circle opens into its complement and you have that infinity sign, then you have consciousness. Even 5,000 years ago in the pyramid text, the symbol for eternal life were the great royal cobras curved in interlocking infinity signs. If you look at the Pyramid of Eunice, published in the Bollingen series and the great pyramid texts of Alexander Pionkov, you see there in the sarcophagus room, lining it like a tapestry of joy, 
infinite curls of the sacred serpent, the Urias, the Kundalini energy in these infinity signs. A Gurdjieffian physician in London once, Maurice Nicole, wrote a book about it called Living Time, of how the interlocking infinity signs are really an eternal resonance of one infinity sign which occurs because it's your life. Having the natural integration and the conscious differentiation linked together. And when that linking is there, it has a curious kind of a quality. It's known in uh, late 20th century physics as the physics of the soliton. The soliton is a particle which is so integrated that when it vibrates, every part of its vibration is the entirety of the particle. A bell cast into perfect form, when rung, the sound waves will be in the shape of a bell into infinity. If you have violins in a room tuned perfectly to the same octave, you can play E flat on one violin and all the others in the room will vibrate to E flat. It's like that. The Pythagorean community of consciousness is an actuality throughout the entire diagonal of the physical universe, including the universe of consciousness. Plato writes this, of that place beyond the heavens, none of our earthly poets has yet sung, and none shall sing worthily, but this is the manner of it, for assuredly we must be bold to speak what is true. Above all, when our discourse is above truth, it is there that truth being dwells, without color or shape that cannot be touched. Reason alone, the soul's pilot, can behold it, and all true knowledge is knowledge thereof. Now even as the mind of a god is nourished by reason and knowledge, so also is it with every soul that has a care to receive her proper food. Wherefore she at last has beheld being, she is content, and contemplating truth, she is nourished and prospers. 2,400 years ago. Now, if this kind of intelligence could be there in the middle of symbolic civilization, we at least can catch up with that at the end of symbolic civilization. Because another old wisdom principle is true. Before you can move to a new level, you have to completely fill that previous stage. You can't go beyond until what is there is saturated. It's the principle of alchemy. You can only precipitate a new form out of a super saturated solution. And what we're doing now in this education is we're super saturating the medium of symbolic civilization so that it will precipitate out for us whatever is there new. I don't know what's there for you. For me, it's to do this, to share this. I don't sit here as an expert, but as a guide, as a friend, as somebody who is willing to set it all aside every single time and spontaneously try to go through it again with you. I don't know how this course is going to turn out through next year. But I do know that previously, many times, it's worked very well, and surprisingly so. But what will come out is not my understanding for you, but your understanding. And that the degree, the fineness, the elegance of that understanding is just totally proportionate to your love of doing it. In a brief way, the only energy that seems to carry boundlessly 
A consonance is love. And it carries it without any effort whatsoever. To the extent that there's a struggle, there's a resistance. Those resistances cannot be got with supersonic weeders. Because the whole thing is, is you need those energies of those resistances. So rather than weeding them out, one has to go through this algorithmic relearning, recalibration of being able to bring oneself back and learn again until the effort is like flying. This is simply what you do. You don't make a big thing out of it one way or the other. Just simply, it's what you do. More next week, thank you. Thank you.